Bueno, pues buenos días. Eh, para los que no me conocéis, la mayoría me conocéis aquí, pero para los que, los que no me conocéis, soy Xavier Calvet, del SAD de Naucasting. Vale. Bueno, eh, hoy tengo el honor y el placer de presentar a doctor Mark Brumhan, del que es un científico de teledetección. Trabaja, en, como estáis viendo en la presentación, en el Bureau of Meteorology, que es el servicio meteorológico australiano. Trabaja en el equipo de aplicaciones de satélite, en el programa de innovación y ciencia y está trabajando en mejorar las capacidades del satélite Himawari. Himawari es el equivalente de MSG, pero está colocado sobre el Océano Pacífico, es un satélite japonés geoestacionario. Eh, es una generación más allá del MSG, sería el equivalente al futuro MTG nuestro pero ya está en órbita y ya está funcionando desde hace, no sé, ¿qué año es hace? ¿Himawari? ¿Qué año es Himawari? Uh, desde 2015. Sí, pues eso, un par de años más o menos lleva en funcionamiento. Eh, fue el primero de la serie de nueva generación que se lanzó al espacio, ¿no? el Himawari, el japonés. Bueno, entonces, como veis, eh, trabaja en, o sea, es el equivalente nuestro del SAB de Nowcasting, pero en Australia. Entonces, pues hemos empezado una cooperación en el producto de precipitación y por eso está aquí. Y aprovechamos que está aquí para que dé una introducción al, al Bureau of Meteorology de Australia. Um, thank you. Uh, I just have to apologize for my croaky voice. Uh, it's a gift from our friends in Italy. Um, Not very well appreciated, I'm, I'm afraid. Um, as Xavier has said, I'm from the Bureau of Meteorology uh, in Melbourne. Uh, we refer to ourselves as the BOM, uh, B-O-M. Uh, and um, well, let's continue. So what I wanted to do today was, um, now does anyone here actually know much about Australia? No? Okay. So I'll give you a little bit of Uh, cultural exchange, um, tell you a little bit about Australia, um, then I'll follow that with an overview of the Bureau of Meteorology and, and its role, uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about my group, which is uh, science and innovation, science to services, weather and environmental prediction, and the satellite application group is which where, is where I sit. Um, so I'm not actually a meteorologist. Uh, my training is uh, specifically in satellite um, applications um, and physical processes of the atmosphere. Uh, but I'm actually at the Bureau now and I'm developing uh, meteorolo meteorological um, applications from satellites. So I'm going to show you some uh, animations um, and things that are more about weather prediction uh, and I'll try to answer any questions that anyone has. But please bear in mind that I'm not a meteorologist So if you have specific questions, um, by all means, I can probably hook you up with somebody who can answer those questions. Um, and at the end, I'll take those questions. So just to point out, Australia is actually fairly large. Um, so that's Spain in the middle. So as you see, that'll fit into Australia many, many times. Um, we have uh, six states and one territory. So Um, I actually live at the moment in, is that actually turning up on the screen? No. I actually live in uh, Melbourne, which is in Victoria, which is uh, Australia's second biggest state. Uh, there we are. That's where the Bureau of Meteorology uh, head office is um, located. But we also have offices in all of those other states. Uh, and we have two severe weather desks, one in Western Australia and one in Queensland, where they, um, they do this uh, tropical cyclone Uh, uh, work, uh, so when we have the cyclone season. I think that's all I wanted to say about that one. Okay, so the um, map on the right is a population density map of Australia rounded to the nearest whole person. So as you can see, pretty much nobody lives in Australia. Uh, everybody lives in the major cities, uh, which are Perth in Western Australia, which is on this side. Uh, Adelaide, which is um, where the really big sharks are. Uh, no, in the, in the 
So where the really big sharks are, that's called the Great Australian Bite. Yeah, can you use the mouse? Ah, here we go. So, so this is Adelaide, uh, this is Melbourne, uh, this is Sydney, uh, this is Brisbane, and Darwin is in the Northern Territory uh, up here. Um, and Hobart is the capital of Tasmania. So as you can see, most people in Australia live um, in the major cities. Uh, plus, we have many sharks, uh, Irukandji jellyfish, crocodiles. Um, we have a population of about 23 million people, which is about half of Spain, roughly. Um, and we have about 23 trillion flies to go along with those uh, people. Plus, we have snakes, crocodiles, roos or kangaroos, emus, uh, scorpions, centipedes, bung arrows, which are a big lizard. Uh, we have spinifex, which is a type of prickly grass, um, valuable rocks because we do a lot of mining, uh, sheep and agriculture, a fair bit of that, um, and many, many other things that can kill you and make your life unpleasant. But I've lived in Australia for nearly 50 years and I haven't been killed once. So um, if you do visit Australia, the chances are you'll get out alive. So the peoples of Australia, uh, the first peoples of Australia, the indigenous uh, population has been in Australia for at least 40,000 years, possibly longer. Um, the map you see there on the uh, left is a map of the languages spoken by the indigenous peoples. Uh, as you can see, there's many, many different languages and um, an indigenous uh, group from maybe one valley wouldn't be able to converse with an indigenous person from another valley because their languages were quite um, different and they, even though they were nomadic, they didn't actually roam too far from their home range. Uh, unfortunately, as in most countries where there's an indigenous population uh, and Europeans move in, their culture is slowly disappearing, their languages are slowly disappearing. Um, which is a tiny bit of a problem. Uh, so Europeans have been in Australia for, well, it says 1606 was probably the first contact with Australia. Um, and the first, what we call the first fleet, which was made up of um, boats from England that landed in Sydney in uh, 1788. So that's when we um, celebrate our uh, uh, Australia Day, which is on that date, which is the 27th of uh, January. Um, so there was actually a, a bunch of different colonies um, which uh, were uh, mostly landed by the, uh, by the English and in 1901 uh, those colonies became the Commonwealth of Australia which is as we know it today. Uh, we're also very multicultural in Australia because um, apart from the indigenous population which is actually a fairly small percentage of our population, everyone's come from somewhere else. So predominantly English, but we have um, uh, many peoples from Asia now, um, many Europeans, um, and generally people from all over the world. Um, and as I said, most of the people in Australia live in the big cities. Uh, so here's just a few pictures of Australia, and just to prove that I wasn't lying about the flies, this is actually um, me on one of the field trips I was on. Uh, and that was just the flies on, on my backpack. Um, there was flies everywhere. Um, we do really have a lot of flies. Uh, this is a golden orb spider. Um, even though it doesn't look that big in that picture there, it would cover your entire face if it sat on your face. Um, as I said, we do a lot of... Uh, uh, Australia's economy is based on, um, on exports. So we, we have a lot of agriculture. So... We ship uh, sheep and cattle overseas, plus a lot of wheat. We do a lot of wheat farming where we, we ship that overseas, uh, and also mining. Um, so this is one of the mining trucks, um, which uh, can take about 200 tonne of dirt um, and minerals. So as you can see, they're quite large. They're about the size of a, of a uh, small house. Uh, this is Bondi Beach. So Australia has a, a big beach culture because we're surrounded by ocean. Uh, in fact, I saw something the other day, whereas if, if, you, if you visit a new beach in Australia every day, you'd, well, you'd never be able to do it. You'd die before you had a chance to visit every beach. So we have a lot of uh, beaches. Um, 
And this is uh, an Australian sport. Um, this is the Melbourne Cricket Ground uh, in Melbourne. Uh, it holds about 100,000 people, and that's where um, uh, Australian rules football is played. I won't go in to try and explain how that works, but it's, it's really nothing like uh, football. Um, it's a lot more violent, uh, and I think it's a lot more fun to play. Okay, so if you talk to me, um, I will try not to speak too much like an Australian because it can be confusing. So one thing we do is we like to shorten everything. So as I mentioned, the Melbourne Cricket Ground before, or the MCG, if you live in Melbourne, you just call it the G uh, because we like to save time. Um, so names are shortened as well. So my name is Broomhall. I'd be called Broomy. Um, is your last name Alvarez? Yeah, you'd be called Alvo. Okay. So we just shorten everything. Uh, a barbecue would just be called a Barbie, <laughs> and not the doll. A mosquito is called a mozzie. So you get the picture. Uh, the other thing we do is we, we tend to understate things. So if for some reason your house burnt down, you'd go to work the next day and said, I had a bit of a fire. So, And also the correct response to almost any question is no worries. So if you ask me a question, I'll say no worries. So here's a, here's a quick sentence. Um, so I might say to somebody, hey, Broomy, how would you and the missus like to come over Sad Diavo for a bit of a barbie and a couple of quiet tinnies? Now, to translate that is, would you and your wife like to come over on Saturday afternoon uh, for a, a barbecue dinner and a few drinks? But that's the same sentence. <laughs> of course, you'd answer no worries. All right, enough of the cultural uh, references, and I'll um, give you a little bit of um, a background on what the Bureau of Meteorology in Melbourne does. So uh, probably like AEMET, we're a 24-7 uh, service, so we operate at all times. Um, we do weather, climate, oceans, water, and also space weather as well. Um, now, this slide is a little bit old because the building you see here now, when we moved into that... Um, about 10 years ago, that was the only building in that area. Now we've been dwarfed by other buildings. So, um, as I said, this slide might be a bit old, but we have around 1,700 staff, although as we uh, are now automating a lot of our um, uh, observing stations uh, in the more remote areas of Australia, um, that number will probably fall. Um, so 330,000 forecasts, 22,000 warnings, um, 350,000 aircraft forecasts and warnings. Uh, we have a very large observing network um, and we have a budget of 320 million and assets of 500 million and we're also part of the WMO. <laughs> so um, we do forecasting, um, monitoring. Uh, we, uh, you know, like um, most uh, weather organisations around the world, we, we have a web page, we have services that, um, that we provide to the public. So that is the, essentially the front page of the, of the Bureau website. Um, and we're the uh, most visited government website uh, in Australia. And I was surprised to find out we were 22nd overall. I thought we'd be a bit higher, but um, people seem to like YouTube more for some reason. Um, so we do tropical cyclones, uh, severe weather. We also do fire weather. Uh, so we have uh, lots of troubles with bushfires, much the same as what they're having in uh, Portugal at the moment. Uh, we, we have tsunami warning systems. Uh, we do flood forecasting and flood warnings, uh, volcanic ash, heat waves. Um, we keep the climate records for the, for the country. Uh, and I just threw that one up called asthma weather because that's something that was quite new and I'll have a little bit of a talk about that later. So our users, um, like most other uh, MET services around the world, um, you know, aviation is um, one of our big users. Uh, so agriculture as well, defence. So we do all the um, forecasting for defence. Uh, I know like in Italy they have their own weather service in the, in the military, uh, but we do that for them. Um, 
the energy sector, planning and environment, uh, health. So things like heat waves and this asthma weather I will be talking about later. Um, we do all the water accounting uh, as well um, and many other things. Uh, so basically in Australia, if there's a forecast of some sort, generally we do it. So the observing network, we have um, um, point sources. So we have uh, rain gauges, we have uh, balloon launches, um, uh, we have radar, we have lightning detectors, and we also uh, use satellites quite um, quite extensively uh, because, as you saw before, we have a very uh, small population and a very large area, so it's not possible to have all of that monitored. So satellites are the only way. Uh, so this is the um, upper air network, so where we launch the balloons from. Um, so 16 audio sons, 16 balloon launches. Uh, uh, we do ha also have um, people in Antarctica full time. Uh, so we have observers and forecasters in Antarctica. Uh, we also have 11 wind profilers. So although the coverage is nationwide, it's not really very, um, it's not very dense. So very, very small point. Uh, forecasts. Uh, so this is the uh, radar network. Now as you can see all of the radars are around the coast because that's where everybody lives. Um, while not many people live up here, uh, this is where all the infrastructure for, um, for mining and gas, uh, a lot of exports uh, actually move out of the top part of the country. So there's a radar network there protecting uh, all the expensive infrastructure. Um, here there's three new radars which are going in. This is called the Wheat Belt of Western Australia. And as it says, um, a lot of wheat is produced in there. And this one's actually funded by the Western Australian government. So the, there was some political um, uh, moves by the farmers in Western Australia and the Western Australian government have funded three new um, radars which we are now running. Uh, so the flood forecasting, um, most of these would be in estuaries and uh, and catchments and, and, and waterways like that. Uh, many rivers in Australia uh, are not permanent. So you'll, you'll, you'll see something called uh, the Ashburton River or, or something like that. It's not really a river 95% of the time. It's actually just a dry creek bed. Um, but when it rains, it floods almost immediately. So um, we have flood forecasters um, who, whose job is to actually forecast uh, um, these sort of flooding events because they can happen quite quickly. Uh, so we, we have um, eight satellite reception stations. So as well as um, using geostationary satellites, uh, we pick up um, quite a lot of the polar satellites, so um, things like HERS and AIRS and IARSI, uh, um, plus MODIS, VIRS. Um, we'll pick up the new JPSS when they start launching those. Uh, essentially anything that can that direct broadcasts, we will pick it up. So there's uh, a collection of these around the country. Uh, plus we also have um, Davis uh, and Casey, which is in Antarctica. Uh, so there is a list of satellites there, but we actually do receive a lot more than just those. Uh, we also have a marine uh, observing network. So um, we have uh, information that comes from boats. We also have information that comes from uh, from buoys which are deployed um, around the place, uh, some by us, some by other people. Um, and these are used for uh, tsunamis, uh, sea surface temperature and, and a few other um, marine uh, products that we actually produce. So one of the projects that we are involved in is a thing called e-reefs where we um, look after the health of the uh, Great Barrier Reef. So there's problems with the reef dying off because of 
increase in temperature because coral is very sensitive to changes in temperature uh, and also predation by a thing called the uh, crown of thorn starfish. Uh, so water quality, sea surface temperature is something we provide um, to this program called e-reefs. Okay, well that's more or less the same thing, so we'll just skip that. Uh, the other, th one of the other things we do is uh, space weather. So um, obviously, when you get solar flares, um, they tend to upset um, uh, satellite systems and also telecommunications. So we do keep an eye on that sort of stuff. Um, and there is, uh, I have actually been to this station up here at Learmonth. Uh, so we have space weather instruments up there, plus we have a, uh, some, uh, in many of these other ones as well, we have uh, things that observe uh, the sun for um, atmospheric parameters such as aerosol. Um, we also um, uh, have ozone network as well at some of these stations. Um, one of the other things that we were also um, in charge of is the uh, Cape Grim Baseline Air Pollution Station. So if you remember that picture from Australia before, Tasmania is at the bottom and Cape Grim is right at the very tip of uh, the northwest of Tasmania. So the air that comes um, here can come from many directions, but there is a uh, essentially a, uh, a quarter of the sky when the wind comes from this direction, so it's coming from uh, directly from the west or from the southwest, that's when they collect the, um, the air as, a, as the baseline uh, observing network because air that comes from there has either come from Antarctica or possibly the tip of um, uh, South Africa. So there's really nothing between uh, Cape Grim uh, and there's really not, not much on that latitude. So the, it, it's sort of a measure of the baseline air without um, actual pollutants from, um, from man. Uh, and there are a few others of these in the world. I can't tell you where they are, but I, I know we have this one here. So this feeds into um, uh, things like CO2 levels, um, uh, nitrous oxide, ozone, things like that. Now, uh, as I said, I'm not a meteorologist, so I'm, I'm not really 100% um, on the models that we have running in Australia, but these are the essentially the um, zones that they run over. So all of our models are called ACCESS, uh, and this is based on uh, code from the UK Met Office, but we've adapted it to work uh, in Australia. So we have all these um, different uh, zones called ACCESS R or ACCESS C or access TC or something of, of that nature. Um, and I can't tell you how often these run. Uh, I do know that the, the um, things like access TC probably run more frequently when we're looking at tropical cyclones or um, if there's for some reason a natural disaster that, that they need to keep an eye on, they'll run these models uh, more frequently. As I said, if you have uh, questions about this, I can probably put you in touch with somebody who can answer them. Uh, so the stuff I'm going to talk about now is more about what my um, group, uh, my research group at the Bureau does. Um, so high impact weather applications. Um, so calibrated thunder, tropical cyclone ensembles and uh, wind and waves, uh, smoke and air quality forecasts, and thunder asthma, thunderstorm asthma, which is more to do with public health. Um, fire atmosphere modelling, so we actually run models to try and predict where fires are going to go based on the weather. Um, and we also have an Antarctic um, uh, research uh, division which uh, looks at Antarctic weather. Um, so as I said, um, I've thrown some of these slides together, so I'm not entirely sure what I'm talking about here. But uh, essentially, um, you know, we, we take observations, we run models um, that in, informs on hazards and what impacts uh, those hazards will have. And then there's some operational decisions made, and this is passed out to groups that deal with these sorts of things. So you know, fire brigades, um, police, um, aviation, 
whatever. Um, so uh, this is a um, slide on uh, some of the numerical weather prediction models that were run uh, for fire weather. So uh, on the 7th of February 2009, we had some really, really severe fires in Victoria and many people were killed um, because the, uh, there was a massive heat wave and we had temperatures reaching nearly 50 degrees in Victoria. So you can see um, uh, in Victoria, um, you can see the cold front come through as the temperature changes. Uh, and hopefully this will go back to the staff. So you can see this is a, at the start of the day and you can see the temperature slowly increase and it gets hotter and hotter and hotter and the fires, uh, there were strong winds and the fires just went absolutely ballistic. Uh, and there was actually an image I've seen where the fire was running up a hill at about 60 kilometres an hour. So if you were trapped uh, in the fire, you had absolutely no chance of getting away and uh, many people were actually killed. So this is all based on numerical, numerical weather prediction and this is the sort of thing that we'd, we'd provide to uh, fire brigades to, to de decide whether, where to deploy their um, equipment and also to evacuate people. Uh, so this is a, a similar um, uh, animation. Uh, once again, I'm not really sure um, exactly what it is, but you can see um, wind gathering in um, actual uh, topographical features. Uh, and you can also see the, uh, at the start of this animation, you can see the, uh, the wind barbs actually wobbling. And apparently, uh, according to my information, that makes uh, the spread of the fire even worse. So for people who know how to read this, it's actually quite, quite informative. Okay, this is something that happened uh, last year. We had um, we had uh, a, a bunch of so nine people all up died from this um, thunderstorm asthma event. Uh, so the weather conditions actually whipped up pollen and dust uh, up into the up into a storm system. The storm system actually dispersed this, and there was many many cases of asthma. Um, and there just wasn't enough ambulances and, and, and uh, emergency medical people to deal with the outbreak of asthma. Um, people were actually dying on their doorstep waiting for um, ambulances to turn up. So this is something that nobody was really aware of, that there was such a thing as thunderstorm asthma, but apparently it is, a, um, it is something that we're now researching. So um, this is the hypothesised mechanism where the outflow actually whips up the... Um, the pollen and the dust, and it's actually sucked up into the thunderstorm and then it disperses the, the asthma-causing asthma uh, agents over a wide area, uh, and you get these big outbreaks of asthma and um, there's no one to deal with it. So if this is something that we can um, predict, then we'll have more, um, we'll be able to inform medical uh, people to be ready for an influx of asthma patients. Okay, so this is uh, some images from Himawari, um, the Advanced Himawari Imager, which is the, um, the new satellite system that uh, JMA run. Uh, so it's a 16-band instrument um, located at 140 East, roughly, uh, and it takes 10-minute uh, full-disc scans, and it can take uh, two-and-a-half-minute scans of Japan, um, and it also, I think, can take rapid scans of um, events like tropical cyclones. So at the Bureau, we received the 10-minute scan information. Um, and because for the first time in a long time, there's actually red, green and blue bands, we can actually make really nice uh, true colour images from geostationary satellite. Um, can anyone guess what that is? Because it took me a while. Now, I thought this was in Australia, which is why I was confused, because we don't have any volcanoes in Australia. But this is actually a rapid scan. Hmm? It's an eruption. Hmm. So, as you can see, the, the, the rapid scan on the satellite picks these events up very nicely. So, 
you can see the, uh, the initial eruption and the spread of the, of the ash cloud. Um, all right, how about this one? Eclipse, yes. So this is an eclipse that happened uh, last year. Um, I know when the Americans um, had their new, they've got their new um, satellite up as well, and they were they were crowing about capturing an eclipse uh, this year, but we've already done it, so uh, I didn't have the heart to tell them. Uh, so this is a product we we haven't bought out yet, but we will. So this is the uh, essentially the the weather map that we'd be showing um, to the public. So uh, this is a Rayleigh corrected true colour image. Um, and as the, as the Terminator sweeps around, we, uh, we simply um, substitute in the, the band uh, 14 uh, brightness temperature. So you get a seamless um, weather picture. Um, one of the other little projects that we're working on uh, because we have a long um, archive of uh, GMS data, which is the, the earliest satellite system that uh, JMA um, had, uh, and it was a spin-scan stabilised uh, satellite. So essentially, as, as it spun, um, as the, as the uh, viewing optics came around, they'd, they'd scan the Earth and they'd go around again and the mirror would tilt and it'd scan the next line. Uh, unfortunately, these type of uh, satellite systems because they're spinning, they also process, um, which means that the, the pointing and the navigation can actually be quite problematic. But um, we're involved in trying to do some uh, reclassification of uh, tropical cyclones. So this has required us having to re-navigate um, this old satellite imagery. And as you can see, the one on the left is uh, before it's been re-navigated, and you can see it wobbling all over the place. And the one on the right is actually much, much better. Uh, so this is some of the other things that we do. Um, so we do uh, a lot of surface-based um, products, which we do from polar orbiters. So solar radiation, grassland curing, NDVI, sea surface temperature, uh, and so on. Um, we also take sounder radiances, which go into the NWP, um, uh, forecast imagery and some of the things that our group will be doing soon and that'll probably be me. Uh, cloud properties, uh, convective initiation, precipitation which I'm working on at the moment with um, Xavier um, and some advanced Dvorak analysis. So um, I doubt no one here has ever done a tropical cyclone forecast so you wouldn't know what Dvorak is so I won't go into it. Uh, so here's a couple of images um, from RGB products um, from Himawari. I assume these are very similar to what's uh, currently done with uh, Severi. Uh, and because we have a few more bands, there's a possibility that there, there'll be more um, RGBs uh, for, for different product products. But they're quite pretty and colourful, so I thought I'd show them. Um, we're also doing uh, sea surface temperature from uh, Himawari, which is something that's not really been possible before this. Um, so this will give us a uh, sort of 10-minute um, uh, sea surface temperature. So we'll be able to see, um, we actually get uh, currents uh, that flow down from the north. Uh, so there's a, a current that flows down in Western Australia called the Lewin Current. Um, and you can get big heat pulses. So you can follow these down, uh, and they have uh, issues for um, fish and seagrass and, and coral who don't really like uh, changes in temperature. Um, plus there's the East Australian current which flows down uh, from the north, uh, and that can have issues for um, the lower part of the Great Barrier Reef. Uh, so we do solar radiation uh, forecasts. Uh, Australia gets probably more sun than any other place in the entire world. Um, but unfortunately, we don't make a lot of use of it. Uh, unlike Germany, which has a massive um, uh, solar power, is a massive part of their power generation plans, we don't make as much use of it as we possibly could. But um, 
these satellite-based radiation products are used by companies who are who are trying to get into this field, so they know where to place their um, their infrastructure to get the maximum benefit. Oh, and that's it. Sorry, I ran out of slides. So, uh, does anyone have any questions? Stun them into silence. ¿Alguna pregunta de las delegaciones? No. Bueno, pues... Thank you, Mark, for giving this nice talk. Thank you. Ah, sí. Thank you for your talk. Uh, for the numerical weather prediction, do you have any agreement with the Met Office or how does it work? You know? Uh, I'm not entirely sure how it works, but um, uh, I believe there's a fair, a fair bit of collaboration between uh, the Met Office and, uh, and the Bureau. Uh, and I think a lot of the code that we run uh, comes from the, from the Met Bureau, from the Met Office, sorry. Uh, currently, we do have two people from the Met Office spending two years in um, in Australia, and they're actually working on on the model. So I can't tell you much more than that. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, you have talked uh, before uh, about the automatization of of the workforce, and then it is uh, falling. Uh, which parts of the Bureau of Meteorology are automatizing are, are, are becoming more automatized now? Uh, well, we had a we had a, a large observing network, so they used to um, launch the balloons. They they take the temperature. They do the you know the octaves in the sky. Um, they uh, you know they take all the observations. So those stations, which were where there was a lot of manual um, observations taken, uh, they're now being replaced with um, with automated uh, machines, uh, so they run until they fail, and then people will come in and fix it. Uh -huh. And is it happening too in airports, or no, no. not in airports? Only in the in uh, yeah, sign up, sign up uh, yeah. stations. Or, yeah. So essentially, the, every state has its own um, office. So and there are maybe a couple of large regional centres. So all of the observers who are in these remoter um, regions, they're all being moved centrally. So now if there's an issue, they, they will go back to the station and repair it, um, but they're all based um, uh, more centrally now. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Bueno, más preguntas? De los centros regionales. No. Bueno, pues muchas gracias. No, gracias. gracias muy Mar. interesante. ¿Tienes alguna pregunta? Uh, no. <laughs> gracias. Vale, pues gracias. She said it's very interesting. Mm. Gracias. <laughs> bueno, pues thank you for the talk and creo que ha sido muy interesante, sobre todo la primera parte de cultural ha sido muy muy buena y gracias gracias por asistir vosotros